वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय हरे कृष्णा सो टुडे वी विल रीड फ्रॉम द भगवत गीता सो जस्ट फॉर दोस ऑफ यू हु आर हियर फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम दिस इज द भगवत गीता इज अ ब्यूटीफुल बुक and in this book uh, which is over 5000 years old all the major truths of life every question every dilemma every doubt every confusion that we face in our life can be addressed directly by the bhagavad gita and therefore it's a beautiful book which uh, speaks to us at all times places in our life and is eternally relevant and therefore uh, we continually keep going back to it they say a book is a present that you can open again and again <laughs> because usually a present you open it once and bas but this one you can open it again and again it's very wonderful and uh, today we're reading from the second chapter of the bhagavad gita the second chapter is a beautiful chapter because it actually summarizes all the major teachings of the bhagavad gita and the last section of the chapter is very interesting because it talks about the qualities of someone who has developed a very high level of spirituality you know like in the world today they have books like the seven qualities of highly effective people so uh, we have the bhagavad gita which is the many many qualities of those who are spiritually very elevated So we are going to read from one of the verses in that section talking about someone who has achieved a high level of spiritual accomplishment. So this is uh, text number 61 uh, chapter number 2. Um I guess I will just read the Sanskrit and translation and some of the commentary myself. So please uh, uh listen carefully. Um Would you like to try to repeat it after me? I think you can do it. You are a highly intelligent crowd. Tani sarvani samyam ya. Yukta asi tamat paraha. Vasehi asyandriyani. Tasya pragya pratistita. A <laughs> Well done very good Okay so this is the English translation One who restrains his senses keeping them under full control and fixes his consciousness upon me is known as a man of steady intelligence This is referring to man as in human so it refers to men and ladies also Purple that the highest conception of yoga perfection is krishna consciousness is clearly explained in this verse and unless one is krishna consciousness conscious it is not at all possible to control the senses as cited above the great sage durvasa muni picked a quarrel with maharaj ambarish and durvasa muni unnecessarily became angry out of pride and therefore could not check his senses on the other hand the king although not as powerful a yogi as the sage but a devotee of the lord silently tolerated all the sage's injustices and thereby emerged victorious the king was able to control his senses because of the following qualifications and then it's mentioned his spiritual practice i'll just stop there i'll focus on what shila prabhupad says here um i'll just begin with some prayers and then we'll have a discussion om agyana timirandhasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine 
Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesh Shunyavadi Paschatyade Shatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vaishadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki So in this purple a very very ancient story is given I won't go into the details of the story because it's a very long story but essentially there was a great sage his name was Durvasa and although he was a great sage he was prone to losing his temper in fact his name Durvasa literally means one who's difficult to live with <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine having a name like that? Vas means to live and Dur means very difficult. You know, some people you look at, the, I'm, I'm sure you're looking at the room now or in your mind thinking, that guy's a Dur Vasa as well. You know? <laughs> I hope you're not looking at your partner, of course. <laughs> so Dur Vasa Muni literally means someone who's difficult to live with. He, although a sage, externally, he was prone to losing his temper. Ambarish, on the other hand, was a king. He was absorbed in so many material responsibilities, but internally he had a great deal of tolerance. He had a great deal of equanimity of mind. He had incredible amounts of restraint. And therefore, although externally Durvasa was the sage, and Ambarish was the person of the world. When they interacted, it was displayed to the world that the king, Ambarish, who supposedly was a person of the world, was actually much more spiritually accomplished than Durvasa. Because Durvasa Muni always wanted to get into arguments Whereas Ambarish, when he was provoked, he never lost his cool. The ability in this world to keep a cool head is very, very difficult for people. They say your mouth should be like a sweet factory and your head should be like an ice factory. <laughs> One time Srila Prabhupada was in the Bhaktivedanta Manor where I live and uh, one lady reporter had come uh, in the press conference and she put her hand up and she said, uh, Swamiji, why do you shave your head? It was, like, it was a pretty confrontational question. You know what Srila Prabhupada's reply was? He looked straight back at her and said, why do you shave your legs? <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh my God, like, uh, she wasn't ready for that, like, uh, <laughs> and then, and then Srila Prabhupada lightened the atmosphere, he said, we prefer warm legs and a cool head. <laughs> you need a cool head for spiritual life. So we are prone to harshness, we are prone to losing our emotions, we are prone to picking unnecessary arguments with others. Let me just do a little bit of a survey here because I know you are all very honest. Put your hand up if you had an argument with someone in the last week. There you go. Thank you for coming to the Hare Krishna temple. This is the place to atone for your sins. <laughs> argument, this, this age, interestingly enough, is known as Kali Yuga, isn't it? And one of the main problems of this age is that people constantly argue because people are not in control of their emotions. People don't have equanimity of mind. Here Krishna says, 
one who is able to restrain their mind and senses, keeping them under full control, is known as a person of steady intelligence. So what happens in the world today is that people don't have that kind of equanimity of consciousness. We pick unnecessary arguments with people. And uh, therefore this age is known as the age of quarrel. Um, in the cosmic times it's said that there are four kind of cosmic ages. You know, like you have the seasons, winter, spring, summer, autumn, and then it goes round again. So in the cycle of the cosmos it's said that there are four cosmic ages. The first age is known as Satya, an age of virtue. And in that age it said people very much appreciated each other. In the next age, Treta, things got a little bit worse and people tolerated each other. In the next stage, Dwapara, it got a little bit worse and people fought with each other, but they did it in a civilized way. Now you know what age we live in. <laughs> In this age, people fight and there's no civil, there's no constructive, productive. People just uh, go for each other, isn't it? Road rage. I don't know if you have it in California. Road rage. They even have supermarket rage. Someone once put a post, um, how to have an argument on Facebook. He wrote, step number one, make a comment. <laughs> step number two, just wait. <laughs> but don't worry, the, the responses are coming. It's, gonna, it's soon going to turn into a heavy argument. Because people just argue so much in the world we're living in today because they're not in control of their emotions. It's said that in nature there are basically three energies. One is called tamas or ignorance, one is called passion, which is rajas in Sanskrit, and the third energy is known as sattva or goodness. Now the interesting thing is that anything we do in life can be in any of these modes. So the food that you, can, you eat can be in ignorance, passion or goodness. The food that you eat the way that you parent your children can be in ignorance, passion or goodness. Dare I say it, the way you drive your car can be in ignorance, passion or goodness. I'm not hinting anything to the person who drove us here today. He was very good. <laughs> and even arguments can be in the mode of ignorance, passion and goodness. Arguments in the mode of ignorance are pointless arguments. Arguments in the mode of passion are power arguments. And arguments in the mode of goodness are productive arguments. Now I want you to think about all the arguments you're having in life and ask yourself, are they pointless arguments? Are they power arguments? Or are they productive arguments? Pointless arguments means you argue and nothing good comes out of it. You don't get anything good out of it. It's just all about ego. Srila Prabhupada, our founder, he would once tell the story of how two men were arguing. And one of them said, scissors. No, it was scissors. We cut it with scissors. And the other person said, no, no, we cut it with a knife. <laughs> So they just had started having this argument, so the scissors, knife, scissors, knife, and it just got so heated. And then finally the person saying knife, he took the guy who said it was scissors and he threw him in the ocean. So this guy was drowning in the ocean, and as he was drowning in the ocean, he was saying, no, no, scissors, scissors. <laughs> it's like, okay, relax, you're drowning, just let it go, let it go. Pointless arguments. How many times do we just argue out of ego? You know, sometimes you have an argument with someone and there's a moment in the argument where you realize, 
oh my God, they're right. <laughs> Have you ever had that? You're arguing with someone, it gets more and more heated, and then you realize, oh my God, I'm wrong, they're right. <laughs> but then what do you do in that moment? Just carry on arguing, right? Because <laughs> like, no, 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 now I can't sacrifice my ego, you know, my ego is like... So oftentimes we just argue out of ego. Pointless arguments. Sometimes we argue out of power, power arguments, because we want to get something. We want to achieve, we want to establish our point. We want to set the record straight. But shall I tell you, sometimes in power arguments, you win the argument, but you lose. Because sometimes you can win an argument, but you lose a relationship. Sometimes you can win an argument, but you lose your peace of mind. Sometimes you can win an argument, but you can lose your focus. Sometimes you win an argument, but you lose your character. Then what's the point of winning an argument? No, I won power argument. But you lost. And then there are productive arguments. Sometimes we do have to argue. Sometimes we do have to set the record straight. But in a productive argument, you're ready to listen to the other person. In a productive argument, you're open that if they say something, maybe my opinion will change. In a productive argument, you wait for the right time, the right place, the right uh, words, so that you can actually reach the truth. So why am I starting this whole talk on arguments, you may think? Because this is the age of quarrel. And what's being said in this verse is that we're unable to keep our emotions under control. And this is causing us big problems in our life. Durvasa, he was, not able, he was very, very harsh. And if you're harsh, you can't awaken your spirituality. You can't awaken love. You can't awaken higher consciousness. Durvasa, as soon as he saw something which seemingly was wrong, he just pounced. And he just did something so impulsive. When you act harshly, you act impulsively, you act skeptically, you act disproportionately and you act counterproductively. We may realize that there's a little bit of harshness within us. Because sometimes someone does something and we act <coughs> impulsively, even without giving them an opportunity to explain themselves, we pounce on them. Or what happens is we act skeptically. When someone does something, we naturally think of the worst. Have you noticed our mindset is like that? I knew he was like that. Confirmed. But maybe you could give them the benefit of the doubt. Isn't that the US legal system? Is it? Innocent until proven? Guilty. Yeah, you, are in the, you have to follow the US legal system. We act disproportionately. Even if someone did something wrong, we come down like a ton of bricks. Harshness. Once I was distributing books on the street, and this boy was riding on a bicycle through a pedestrian street. So I was just kind of watching him. He was a kind of an innocent boy. And then four men came with like machine guns. And they stopped this guy on the bicycle. And with their machine guns, they said, you're not allowed to ride a bicycle here. I was like, I mean, <laughs> there are like uh, hundreds of people out here doing like much worse things. I mean, it was a little heavy. It wasn't like, you know, it's like trying to kill a mosquito with a sledgehammer, you know. It's, I mean, it's like, it's okay, like, just relax. Like. But we're always a little harsh. We act disproportionately. And we act counterproductively. When we're harsh, 
we act but we don't improve the situation, our reaction actually makes things even worse. So Durvasa Muni, he was almost the embodiment of harshness. Because he had not control, le learned to control his mind and senses, restrain his emotions. Ambarish, on the other hand, was extremely tolerant, was extremely restrained, was extremely forgiving. Oh my God, can you forgive? That's very difficult. In this day and age, who can learn to forgive? That's very hard. But because Ambarish had controlled his senses, he never took any offense. He never got dragged in to the dog fights of this world. And rather, he just faced it all with grace. In one of the books, Srila Prabhupada writes an amazing line. This is a line that you may want to write down and put it up on your fridge or on your bedroom wall. Srila Prabhupada says, one's greatness is measured by their ability to tolerate provoking situations. Your greatness is measured by your ability to tolerate provoking situations. So here in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying that as we become more and more spiritually accomplished, and as we become more and more connected to the Divine, then what naturally happens is that we develop a tolerance, a forgiveness, a restraint, and a steadiness of emotions that means our life becomes beautiful in all ways. When Nelson Mandela was released from prison after being wrongly imprisoned, one of the devotees of Krishna came to him to give him a Bhagavad Gita. And as he saw the Bhagavad Gita, he said, no, no, I read it already. <laughs> he said, really? He said, yeah, one of the inmates was a Hindu and he gave me the Bhagavad Gita. So the devotee said to him, that's amazing. What did you learn from the Bhagavad Gita? And his answer was amazing. He said, what I learned from the Bhagavad Gita is that the day I walked away from prison, if I didn't at the same time give up my bitterness, my anger, my feelings of negativity towards my perpetrators, then even though walking free from prison, I'd be imprisoned by my own emotions. How many of us are imprisoned by our own emotions? Our mind, one devotee said to me, when I meditate, my mind is like a horror movie. <laughs> we have all these uh, things going on in our mind, all these emotions, all these thoughts, all this negativity. The mind is crazy. Once I had come, I was in London, I had come from the early morning meditation at our temple and I was going into the London underground and you know in the underground they have these escalators that go down and it's full of people, rush hour. So I got on the top of this elevator and it was full of people and then out of nowhere this thought came in my mind, what would happen if I pushed the person in front of me? <laughs> I was like... I'm supposed to be a spiritual guy here, you know, like I just came back from meditation, I came back, you know, I'm like supposed to be serene, calm, nice, I'm a nice guy, you know. That's the mind. That's the uncontrolled mind, comes up with so many things. You know how the mind is described in the ancient scripture? Markatasya surapanam tatra damsanam Tanmadhye bhuta samcharo yadva tadva bhavishyati <laughs> This is how the mind is described in the scripture. It says, Markatasya, ever seen a monkey? Yeah, monkey. Very restless, isn't it? 
Have you ever seen Markatasya Surapanam? Have you ever seen a drunk monkey? Tatra Vrishchika Damsanam. Have you ever seen a drunk monkey bitten by a scorpion? Tan Madhye Bhuta Samcharo. Have you ever seen a drunk monkey bitten by a scorpion and then haunted by a ghost? Yadva Tadva Bhavishyati. Who can predict what such a monkey will do next? That, my friends, is the mind. So the mind is very uncontrolled. How you will be able to control the mind? There's no way to control the mind, save and accept connecting the mind to the Supreme. Therefore, in this verse, the third line is Yukta, Ashita, Madhparaha. Yukta and Yoga are basically the same word. They mean connection. If we are not connected with the divine in yoga, there is no question of having a steady mind. See? <laughs> I'm sure they're doing something spiritual. Um, most people in this world are trying to control their mind trying to blank out the mind yes now I will blank out all of my emotions no it won't work the only way you can control the mind and control the emotions is by connecting them with a uh, with the spiritual source and therefore Durvasa Muni represents harshness uncontrolled emotions but Ambarish represents complete patience, complete forgiveness, complete control. By dint, Savemana Krishna Padara Vindayo Vecham Shikavikuntha Gunanu Varnane Karo Harer Mandira Marjana Disu Shrutim Chakara Chitta Sadkato Daye Like this, it's explained that the reason Ambarish was so forgiving, so peaceful, so serene, is because every aspect of his being was connected to the Supreme. Savei Mana Krishna, his mind was connected to Krishna. Shrutim Chakarat Chita Sutkato Daye, his ears were always hearing spiritual things. Karo Harer Mandira Marjana Disu, his hands were always cleaning the temple. Pado Harek Kshetra Padanu Sharpane, his legs were always walking to the holy places. So like this, he utilized all his senses and mind by connecting them with the Supreme. So this is a very, very beautiful uh, teaching that we're learning here today from the Bhagavad Gita. Now is Sunday and tomorrow is Monday. Monday signifies the beginning of the battle with the material world. Monday morning. <laughs> And out there, know for sure, you will be provoked. Know for sure, out there, you will be distracted, deviated, tempted. Know for sure, out there, there will be many, many things which will displace your emotions. You know, I don't know, in this part of the world, you have earthquakes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Can you predict when an earthquake is going to take place? Can you predict where an earthquake is going to take place? Can you predict how severe the earthquake will be? But let me tell you, there are also life quakes. Every, uh, sorry, now this is the heavy part of the lecture where I give you the bad news, but then I'll come back to some good news. <laughs> the reality of life is that everyone is going to go through some life quakes. That's life. It could be a relationship breakup. It could be a financial crisis. It could be a career problem. Maybe some of you in the room are already going through a life quake. And the emotions become very difficult to control in those times. Sometimes we go to Krishna 
and we say, it's okay for you, you're smiling, what about my life? You look very happy, but I'm having all these difficulties. And so sometimes we feel a little frustrated, we feel like we're the victim. We feel like our emotions overcome us and we can't think clearly. But remember, yukta ashita madbaraha, the more that you're divinely connected, the more you'll be able to frame your emotions, control your mind, and maintain your serenity and calmness and peacefulness, even in the midst of a very, very turbulent world. This is the knowledge you learn from the Bhagavad Gita. I went to school, I went to college, I even went to university. But in my 20 years of education, no one told me how to deal with a life quake. I learned that lesson in the Hare Krishna temple by hearing the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita really is a manual for life. Um, some people think the Bhagavad Gita is a book that you read at the end of your life because it's for the afterlife. No, no. The Bhagavad Gita is a book which is very much helping you to navigate the complexities of this civilization and find uh, a real sense of happiness with it. <coughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Thank you so much for your attention, your kindness. It is 6.45, so I don't know how we do, like, I won't go on and on. So, should we take some questions at this point? So, if anyone has any uh, questions, comments, or anything you'd like to know uh, more about, then I can try to uh, respond. Yes, at the back here. My business is to you. Thank you so much. So how many times do we forgive? <laughs> Once, twice. They say God gives, 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 and then f keeps forgiving. And we get, 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 and keep forgetting. <laughs> Krishna's forgiveness is unlimited. If Krishna's forgiveness was limited, we'd be in trouble. So we are devotees of Krishna, so we also try to embody a very high level of forgiveness. But forgiveness doesn't mean that you don't take practical steps. If someone is uh, very, very negative, then you may keep a distance. If something wrong is being done, then you have to flag it up. You may have to say something. But forgiveness means that you don't hold any negativity in your heart or your mind. If you haven't forgiven them, you're the biggest loser, not them. Because you're holding all that negativity in your mind. So when we talk about forgiveness, it doesn't mean that you don't take practical measures. Sometimes you may keep a distance, or sometimes you may take a practical action to rectify a situation. Sometimes you may speak out, yes. Forgiveness doesn't mean you become passive. But what forgiveness means is that you don't hold any negativity within you. The goal of life is not to remember all the terrible things that someone has done to you. The goal of life is to remember all the beautiful things that Krishna is doing for you at every moment. But you know what? You won't be able to remember that if the mind is hijacked by negativity. Therefore, we have to learn to let go, difficult as it is. And remember, we're just in the transit lounge, just here for some time. Therefore, don't take the illusion too seriously. Here today, gone tomorrow. Easier 
said than done. <laughs> Good luck, and please you wish your luck to me as well. We'll both try, and let's see what happens. Is that okay? Uh, so anyone else would like to? Okay, I see some hands. Uh, yeah, I. Some I guess. <coughs> Well, he's technically known as a rishi. a rishi. So a rishi means a great thinker. So a rishi means a great thinker, one who has knowledge, one who has austerity. So such people uh, may have knowledge, they may have austerity, uh, but it doesn't mean they're a saint. A saint is someone who uh, has fully saturated their heart with love. So therefore, many people may have knowledge. Many people may even be very accomplished in mystic practices. But if you really want to know who's a saint, then find a person whose heart is saturated with love and selflessness. Uh, that is the real measure of who is a saint. And therefore, Ambarish, although surrounded seemingly by worldly opulence, his heart was saturated with love for the divine and love for all beings. And therefore, he was a true saint. So, uh, sometimes it's not just the saffron monks with the shaved heads. Sometimes they are not the saints. I'm the living proof. <laughs> but we're trying. But we're trying. So yes, is that okay? So he was a rishi, he was a sage, but not a saint in that sense. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I guess I didn't know the difference between sage and saint. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. A sage generally means someone who is uh, has a uh, is very accomplished in knowledge. But that doesn't guarantee their character. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who's. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, he's turning it up, he's turning it up, yeah. Yeah, it's coming now. I think in it's good. In devotion, it states that it's uh, considered an offense to criticize others in front of the deities. Now, um, you know, I've, I've witnessed this a lot in, in my travels. I, I travel from the East Coast, and, and this happens quite often where, you know, somebody's giving a, a, a Srimad Bhagavatam or a Bhagavad Gita, you know, lecture, and they, they tend to criticize some of the, uh, you know, aspirants and stuff like this. So how do we tolerate this kind of, so sometimes you see that uh, there is criticism in a, yeah, in a place, in a temple room, or, and clearly this is not something that is encouraged, but we see it. Uh, I think the first thing, let, let me just be very real with you here, because we're all friends and... Uh, uh, you know, we're all a family, as I was saying. Uh, the Hare Krishna movement is like a hospital. <laughs> so that means that not most people in here are still getting better. <laughs> uh, they're not all fully cured just yet. And therefore, uh, even within the Hare Krishna temple, although we see that everyone is very, very sincere, it's not that always everyone will be following immaculate spiritual standards. And when we see it, then we're tolerant. Then we try to look for faults within ourselves and we say, I saw that this wasn't done exactly right. Let me make sure that I never do that. I think if we are, uh, respond in that way, then it's more progressive. Otherwise, if we look around and we get discouraged by everyone's uh, 
different, uh, what to say, shortcomings exactly, then uh, it may not be so inspirational for us. So nowadays, what I try to do is look around at the Hare Krishna movement and say like, wow, that person has that amazing quality and that person does that really well. And uh, this person has a little bit of a difficulty, but they also did this really well. And I think if we approach it in that way, then uh, we, can in, we, can, uh, we can improve and I think we can create a situation where we can improve. So I guess that's how I would approach it. But uh, yeah. Is that okay? Thank you so much for your message. Uh, your question. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. So my question was really about what does an individual do if they feel they were able to forgive, they were able to not criticize, they were able to not forgive this at a point in life? They were able to do it, but they're not able to do it now. But now, for whatever reason, they're not able to do it. You, you mean with a specific person or just in general? general. Oh, okay. Generally, they had, like, the person feels like they had all those abilities to be forgiven. Yeah. But now, they're not able to do it. And to be loved. And then, they find themselves in a situation where after a few years, they're not able to do that, and they're not able to figure out why and how they got here. And my question is, um, for such an individual who kind of keeps comparing themselves with the, the previous themselves and tries to figure out what went wrong, okay, why well, right, yeah. here, and how do I do myself? So sometimes we may feel, thank you so much for your question, we, sometimes we may feel that we were more forgiving two years, three years before, and now we've become less forgiving Sometimes what happens is the world hurts us, isn't it? And when the world hurts us, then we become very closed. See, Once a guru, he called his disciple, and the disciple said, how should I uh, respond to provoking situations? So the guru said, bring three cups of boiling water. So okay, it's going to be a live demonstration. So in the first uh, boiling water, the guru put a potato. And after a few moments, he pulled out the potato and just fell apart. And he said, don't become like this, like fall apart, lose your, you know, resilience. But then in the second glass, he put cotton wool. Cotton wool, very soft, very fluffy. But then when he put the cotton wool into the boiling water, what happened? After some moments, the cotton wool came out shrunken and very hard. And he said, some people become like this. They become very closed, very hard, very uh, unable to connect with people in the same way. He said, don't become like this. And then in the third cup, he put some herbs. And after a few uh, minutes, a beautiful fragrance came out. So let the best come out of you. This is how you should respond. So the reason I'm telling you this story is because sometimes we go through very harsh situations in our life which make us less forgiving. Because then we become skeptical of people. We become like, if I don't stand up for myself, then someone's going to exploit me. And then we become very... The only way we can become forgiving is when our vision of life is expanded. When you have something so much greater that you're trying to achieve in this life, when you have so much of a captivating goal, when you're looking towards the vastness of the spiritual world and the opportunity of perfecting your life, then a few arguments here and there become inconsequential because you're like I've got something so much greater to achieve why am I going to get caught up in all of these things but when we don't have that goal when we don't have that vision when we don't have that broader perspective of what life is about then all the petty fights of this world begin to look very very big 
So to ultimately become forgiven, it's very interesting. On the way to pure love, there are nine stages. I won't, it's a long description. But the prior stage to developing pure love is known as bhav. Bhav means deep spiritual emotion. And it's said that when someone develops deep spiritual absorption, there are certain things that you will observe in their character. And the most amazing thing is, the very first characteristic of someone who has developed spiritual emotion is kshantir, forgiveness. And why are they able to forgive? Because there's so much, something much greater in life. What does it matter what someone said? I'm, I'm on a bigger mission. So we need to become captivated by the great thing that we can achieve in this life and then not get sidetracked uh, by all these things. And you said to me 28 and a half years ago on that Thursday morning, <laughs> oh my God, you still remember that? <laughs> yes, I remember it like yesterday. It's amazing. Just can't let go. Oh yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I saw. I don't know. Like uh, here is the mics. Here is. Oh, Prabhu has a question no, or a no, comment no, or. Uh, my question was: uh, Devasamani got in real big trouble one day. He's been chased all over the universe. By the Sudarshan, yeah. He was asking so many great personalities, you know, can you please help me? This Sudarshan trucker is chasing. Um, what was his the ultimate remedy for his situation? What what did he have to do? He he committed some offense against a devotee. But what was his only way out of it? Yes, I'm sure you know the answer to this, but. Thank you for allowing me to say it. <laughs> After committing this uh, great act, this heinous act towards the great spiritualist Ambarish, then Durvasa was running for his life. He was being chased by a flaming disc which was about to kill him. And therefore he was running all around the universe trying to save himself and everyone was saying we're powerless. And then finally he was told, you have to go to the person whom you offended. You have to go to the person who you uh, misjudged. You have to go to the person who you slighted. And you have to beg for their forgiveness. And when he did that, Ambarish was so saintly. That he said, why, why are you asking for my, I already forget, there was nothing even to forgive. He never held anything. And in that way, Durvasa was saved. So yes, sometimes you have to say sorry. Sorry? Yes. Sometimes you have to just say sorry. And in that sorry, so many things are resolved. No, no, I won't say it until they say it to me. You could be waiting a long time. But maybe, if you just say sorry. Have you ever had this experience? You have an argument with someone. And then at one point, you just take the humble position. And you say, no, no, you know what? I'm wrong. And then in the other person, something awakens. And they're like, no, 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 actually, maybe I was wrong. He said, no, no, I was wrong. No, no, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> and then you start having an argument about who was actually wrong. Right? <laughs> but it's a nice argument. And it's interesting because when you take the ego out of the situation, then you hold the key to resolution. But while there is ego in the formula, there's no progression. Therefore, he told, Durvasa was told, just say sorry and take your ego out of the situation. 
your false ego. Thank you. I think he had a question. You're for the first time. Thank you for coming. So I, my question was, I understand in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Krishna tells Arjuna that our desires are like uh, nectar that's like, it's sweet in the beginning, but ultimately it's poisonous. Yeah. Um, and that these keep us in body. So how, as a devotee, do we um, transcend these um, uh, samskaras and desires? Amazing question, yeah. So Krishna says that there are many desires which you pursue which seem to be really really a good idea now <laughs> and really beneficial but then later on turn out to be quite destructive basically what Krishna tells Arjun is don't give up what you want most for what feels good now that is one of the great arts of life but how do we deal with these uh, desires that keep coming up within us which are no good, which are not really going to serve our purpose? How do we avoid temptation? Oscar Wilde, he says, I can resist everything except temptation. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, temptation, how do we uh, resist it? So I give people an acronym. If you want to resist temptation, it will cost you. C stands for conviction. The first thing is you have to be convinced about the great thing that you're trying to achieve and why these desires don't serve that purpose. So you always have to be convinced about your goal. O stands for openness. If you want to overcome temptation, discuss with other spiritual people. Do you think this is a good idea? Oh, I, I fell prey to this. How can I do better next time? In talking to others and sharing your doubts, your successes, your failures, you develop an inner resilience. S stands for safety. If you're trying to give up alcohol, don't hang around in the pub. <laughs> What often happens is we subject ourselves to people, to environments, to situations which are agitating and therefore unnecessarily is agitating desires in our mind which are not serving us. So save your, protect the boundaries that protect you. And T stands for taste. The ultimate way to overcome all the lower desires, the destructive desires, is to taste something better. Uh, Co was that Coca-Cola, right? Enjoy the taste. Right? <laughs> better than Coca-Cola. You have to enjoy the taste, the higher taste. Therefore, Krishna says in a beautiful verse, Vishaya vinivartante niraha rasya dehina Raso varjam rasopyasya param drishtva nivartate. Uh, if you want to give up the lower rasa, rasa means taste, then you have to experience the uh, higher taste. Therefore, we have a book, The Higher Taste. I'm sure you've read that one. So, yes, these are the ways conviction, openness, safety, and taste. And then, yes then these lower desires disappear. I see more hands. I'm happy to take, but you just let me know when we're running out of time. There's a hand here. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for visiting. Okay, is that we're done now? Unless I'm incorrect. One question. One question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. So in the Gita, uh, as we know, obviously, Krishna uh, convinces 
Arjuna to follow his son and wage the war against his own cousins, that is the Kauravas. Uh, but as uh, as the younger generation starting out in life, how do we know what is our dharma? What should we follow? What is our greater goal in life? So, how do you know what is your dharma? What a great question for the last two minutes of the talk. <laughs> I don't know if I can. My God, we'll have to start a whole other talk here. Okay, let me give you three things. Well, let me tell you one thing and then I'll tell you three things. First thing is that uh, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita we have two types of dharma. We have a sanatan dharma, which is an eternal purpose, which is to get out of this world and get back to where we're meant to be. And that's universal for everyone. Right? Um, and the second dharma is svadharma. That means how you're supposed to live here. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to be a warrior? Or are you supposed to be a teacher? Or are you supposed to, like, how do you live in this world? What's your duty? So the eternal purpose is clear. We're supposed to go back to the spiritual world. But what am I supposed to do here in these years I have? Each of us have a different dharma. So basically, three words you need to memorize are analyze, ask, and attempt. If you want to know what your dharma is, first thing is analyze your own personality. You are an individual. You have unique talents, unique abilities. You have a unique gift that you've been given by God. Some people are amazing singers, and some people are just not. But they might be good at something else. So we have to find out what abilities have I been given? What things am I wired for? What are the natural activities that I gradu uh, gravitate towards? Analyze your personality. Then the second thing is ask. Ask people who know you. What do you think I'm good at? What do you think uh, I could uh, do that would really allow me to unleash my talent? It's difficult to see the picture when you're inside the frame. So sometimes you need someone else to give you some feedback. And then ultimately, if you want to find your dharma, just attempt. Try different things. If you think you're meant to be a teacher, try doing some teaching. And then you'll realize, God, I can't tolerate these kids. <laughs> <laughs> Today was very nice, by the way. I'm not... <laughs> and then you'll realize, yes, yeah, no, no, it's just not me. So sometimes you just have to try, attempt. And like this, Dharma is not something that just comes to you like this. It's a journey, but it's a beautiful journey. And when you live in your Dharma, the Manusmriti says, Dharma, Rakshita, Rakshita. If you protect your Dharma, your Dharma will protect you. So yeah, that's a great journey to try and find your Dharma. Analyze, ask, and attempt. Let us know how it goes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And kindness. <laughs>